wanted to, there's been some awesome discussion of, and this may be going a little bit dark again, but um, you brought up the concept of violence as sexuality or as sexual energy. I would love for someone to address that. And where there was a lot of talk about childhood sexual seeds. And I would love to hear some thoughts on the concept of childhood sexuality, where we're collectively stuck, I think, in relating to children as real, whole beings with a sexual self and a, all of that. And I don't know. I would just love to hear everybody's thoughts on that stuff. Maybe we could switch it up, because I feel like it's been you, you, me, and then like that's been the energy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just always felt like I was going last week on these amazing ladies and being like, well, what do I have about that? Anyway. Um, but this one I spent a lot of time with, you know, childhood trauma, childhood sexual trauma, natural sexuality in childhood that then got disrupted. And what I see commonly is kind of like a couple, there's probably a million cases, but these are the most common, is there's a child that was expressing sexuality, like, say like a, with a, a neighbor or something, and a parent came in and totally shamed it. And energetically, it was like the coolest, most beautiful thing those two beings had encountered. And so then that psychology goes and goes and goes. And then on the other one, and this is the one I deal with all the time, is often there's a parent, um, or you know, it's a babysitter, or it's this, but there's some adult figure that that puts the trauma, there's a traumatic moment. And that's what we look at. We go to the energetic charge and the work I do. And so what we'll often do is we'll relive that moment from that person's perspective energetically and see what's going on. And then Bioenergetics has this beautiful twist where they then channel in the story. It's like a little bit like family constellations, if people know that work. And they have to be the, for one storytelling moment, they're the other, they're the evil one. They're the thing that the energy's been pushed away from. And I have them tell the story, and it's amazing what they channel in or bring in from the quote-unquote perpetrator's perspective. And usually at this point, you start to see that they're more humans. You understand a little more why they're doing this. Compassion opens up. And often just by shining a light onto that one figure, they just start crying and there's already a release. You can just see it, the emotion, the stuck energy, because it's like, finally. The thing I see most, and this is where it gets real Wild West, is there's usually some energetic parasitic attachment that's kind of working through. And this might be a little complicated to just throw into something, but it's, see it so much, I feel like I'd be dishonoring my work without saying I see this. It's almost like germs, germs being beings on the microscopic level. I think there are parasitic energies on the quantum level that can illuminate and turn into power, actually. But often they run in the family lines and haunt the family lines until there's some badass healer like people in this room here that have the courage to love the unlovable and love themselves and illuminate that stuff. So often the third twist will be letting that energy, that attachment express. And usually it's just like sure screaming or yelling or pounding. And then that releases and heals, and then my guide comes in and cleans it all up. And that's the way we work with it a lot. And then I back it up with a lot of pleasure, a lot of love, a lot of joy, bring it as high vibe as I can. I often will have them drinking a martini on the beach energetically. Anything to just bring it as back up to the positivity and right here now as I can. That's how I work with <laughs> the yeah, I think you said some really amazing things. Like all the, the, the things that I was going to touch on. Oh, see? Uh -huh. I, think that there's, <laughs> I think that there's so much to all the shame that we put on sexuality, and especially when it's with children, that our parents are oftentimes projecting their own stuff or their own... A lot of us are stuck, and a lot of us are really rigid, and it's hard for us to see the innocence in sexuality because we put so much behind it, it's so charged for us. It has all these memories and all of these connotations. And for a child to be expressive and curious and just wondering, but 
it creates this fear in a lot of us that it brings our own stuff to the table that we can't just open the space to say, hey, well, what are you experiencing? What is that like for you to explore? We have to sort of bring in, no, this isn't okay because I haven't dealt with my own shit. Like as a parent saying, I'm not able to go there so I can't hold space for you. And I think it's really important to work with children with where they're at. And that's also a great way to investigate what is going on with them. Is there some trauma that we're not looking at because we're too afraid or we're pushing our own stuff? Because that's worth exploring. Because you never know what's going on in that child's life. But a lot of times it's just that, you know, I have all these orifices and, you know, I'm discovering my body and I have these urges within my body and to say that this is okay, this is part of being human. And really checking in to see where that child is at before we put our own stuff on and create this energy of shame. And I also agree with sort of psychic attachments and if there is has been any sexual abuse, that oftentimes it's like there's an energy of that perpetrator, an energy even if it's just the, the thought patterns of shame itself, they can energetically get stuck around that person, literally fill in that space. And if there has been that shame created about it or that secrecy, like you can't tell anyone, this is our little secret, that that can penetrate that person and really stay in them and keep them from being able to have that intimacy to open up fully to a partner later on in life. So I think it's really important to sort of go there, especially just opening up communication with that child and say, hey, where are you at? Let me meet you where you're at. Because that's where the magic happens and you can see this magic unfold with the child just exploring who they are and their own identity as a sexual being or to be able to look and see, is there something that's not okay? And is this how the child is trying to communicate that something's not okay? Because they don't have this developed language. They have it stored in the hippocampus, the amygdala in the brain, in these energy centers that are stored in images or feelings and not words. So to even just give a child a piece of art work, it's like to, to give them pen and paper, or to have them dance it out is a way to help them move that energy and to understand it where you don't have to put all of our own stuff on it. It's so powerful just to check in, see who they are, see where they're at. Yeah, I definitely think that when it comes to kids, we are so invested in our own sexual bullshit that we get so deeply in the way of kids who are just exploring themselves in their own space um, in ways that are totally appropriate. Um, and it's such a deep, deep, dark question, and there's so many different layers with it. Um, and the place that I you know, think I'll go back to it with is um, when I'm with adults and I'm doing something that's sexual or intimate, you are opening up different parts of the brain and you are moving back away from the neocortex and you're moving back into um, some deeper things that go back to moments that are strong and emotional. So you never know what you're gonna run into when you start going into that territory. Um, and I have to very much agree that um, learning to love the unlovable is the great work of the healer who stands in front of essentially whatever the beast is uh, and is not moved and is not afraid. You know, when you think about all of the, a lot of what we do when we test boundaries is we're always, throughout the entirety of our lives, from childhood on to adulthood, we're trying to see where those boundaries are with other people. Um, and a lot of times we want to know that, you know, if we're not at our best and we're really hurting, sometimes when our beast has a stranglehold on us, we want to know that there's going to be someone who will stay with us through that dark moment or that dark night. Um, and we want to know if these people are going to be able to, to stand in front of what our beast is. Uh, and, and to do healing work is to, to be able to like stand right in front of it and still remain able to love, regardless of what comes out of it. And it takes a very particular mindset, it takes uh, a lot of work to, to maintain your own type of emotional boundaries to face it, but it's, it's a powerful moment and with sex it, it does happen. Um, and that's why I think it's important to have healers in sexual scenarios because it does open up so much and a lot of times if you're not prepared to face it, it can be hard for the person experiencing it and the person they're partnered up with who doesn't really know what just happened. You know, they came in with a great intention and all of a sudden they hit a button and it seemed totally normal and they were doing it, you know, an attempt to pleasure somebody. They weren't doing anything wrong. They weren't doing anything non-consensual. And yet there it was, you know. Um, I think it's good to have people who know what to do with that. I'm actually a point where I love my mom. Like, this woman that was a demon in my life, I just love her. 
And the way I got to it, you know how pe healer people talk about acceptance? Acceptance just never worked for me. Because I, I guess I'm just not wired in this way where you need acceptance and acceptance. And once you accept, and I was kind of like, well, fuck acceptance. It's kind of boring. <laughs> but then, I, you know, reading Joseph Campbell and just all the fucked up shit I've had to look at and just like puking up family histories and ceremonies. And I just kind of, my buddy Carl and I in the Psychonaut thing, we just have this line of shit be crazy. Like, when you kind of just accept that, that this is a wild ride, and shit happens, wild stuff in this universe, and it's just shit be crazy, that kind of helped me just, like, now I just look at my mom as a friend. I don't look at her as mom, she's a friend. When she gets back in mom role, then we get in fights. But when she's just another being, shit be crazy, man. Because <laughs> I want us to go through the portal uh, to healing, you know? Shit be crazy, and we can laugh at it, at all the awfulness, and the beauty, and the magnificence of it all. Yeah. I, I just wanted you guys to home, go home with that in your toolbox. Shit be crazy. Huh? Can I go? Okay. Uh, so my brain's just going to explode because like everything that we're talking about, I think about like 24 7. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, where do I start? Um, okay, one question. Go. Um, so, I or help organize this group called the Bay Area Goddess Gathering, and it's only about a year old. And one of the things that I've realized that has come up like almost every single monthly meeting is this, this concept that, I'm going to generalize here, that women don't know how to speak their boundaries and don't feel like they can say no and also have a lot of times had sexual encounters that they didn't actually want to be involved in but ended up doing anyway because they didn't know how to stop it or how to say no or got stuck or whatever. Um, so it's work that all of the women in this group have been doing together and having a collective where we're able to actually check in with each other and say like, hey, I said no the other day and have other women be like, oh my god, that's awesome, is revolutionary. It's really, really huge. It's a really big breakthrough for a lot of us. Um, and unfortunately, this realization has come in our 20s, our 30s, 40s, you know, late in the game, or not necessarily, but. Uh, so I think that sexuality and psychedelics are amazing, love them both, and I think that there's a lot of work that can be done in the overlap, but I think that we as a society can't necessarily get there in a safe way until we learn how to set our boundaries and how to stand ground and how that's okay. So how do we shift our culture into a place where women are able to, to speak their boundaries and feel safe enough to do that and where men are able to kind of back up a little bit and notice that sometimes women aren't able to do that. Go. <laughs> how to change the world in three easy steps. Uh -huh. um, that's something I do a lot of work in. It's something I'm really very sensitive in um, because I am quite involved in feminism, and yet feminism is not always quite involved with me. Uh, in a very particular way, I have been called a traitor to feminism. I have been charged with perpetuating rape in the world because I depict sex on camera and I show that women can be objectified um, because I've shown that women should be instantly available. Uh, you know, and yet, you know, I, I go and I, I deal with that kind of onslaught from what should be my safe women's community, and it is not. And it makes me angry, and I announce that I'm not a feminist, and I leave the room in a huff, and then I step outside, and I'm catcalled, and I'm scared to walk home because I'm still at the end of the day, 5'2", and I'm in this little body, and we do live in a world where it's not the safest kind of body to have in patriarchal surroundings. Uh, and I am trying to change that, and I think finding ways to affirm one, each, one another as often as possible. You know, when you see someone who's, you know, struggling, give them that moment of solidarity, give them that moment of saying, hey, I saw you speak up, that was awesome, that, you know, inspired me. Pass that on. Um, don't let people, you know, if you're able to and you're safe and you're able to reach out, um, support people when they take those bold steps, wherever they might be, and I think we do need to hear that from um, our peers. Uh, supporting each other. I try to talk a lot about um, finding your boundaries and understanding that um, a lot of times we're, you know, we're trained to provide emotional labor and we're trained to provide sexual labor. You get the sense that you know, it's your obligation to tend and mend um, when someone is in distress and learning that that is actually a valuable skill and it is a skill. 
It's not just something that you should innately be doing. It is a skill, and it's something that you have learned to do throughout the course of your life, to hold space, to listen to somebody, um, and to expend that energy. And learning that it's very special, and it's precious, and a great gift, and something that can change someone's entire day, um, feeling empowered and how strong what that gift is, uh, is a really good, powerful first step. And sometimes you can see when there are people who are unjustly infringing upon that skill. And um, you can sit there and know that it's, um, it is precious and they are not entitled to it. That um, emotional labor and sexual labor are real and they take time and energy. They're not just part of the package. And um, I don't think that being a sex worker is inherently liberatory. Uh, I don't think that um, that is what the face of feminism is. Feminism is so diverse, it is so bold um, and big and huge. Um, I can't say that this job that I do is inherently any more liberatory than any other job or workplace that anyone else has. Um, but the moment of liberation that I had was the moment that I could say, this thing that I thought I just had to give to people and do, and I look back on college and the hookups where I knew someone was never going to be able to get me off, but I was going to hold their hand through their experience, because that's just how you finish it up. Um, I realized that, that, that I didn't have to. That when I do that, it's special. And when someone wants to go on a journey with me and they want to share it with me, I love doing that and I love having those moments. If someone is not in a position to go on that journey with me, if they need me to focus on their needs 100% of the time, then I'm going to set that aside and know that it is a skill and it is valuable. And I can decide to give that to someone or they can find a way to compensate me. <laughs> I think an answer to that question is acknowledge your strengths and weaknesses and expression and where you may have some hang-ups or may feel stuck and investigate that. Meditate to it, journey to it, however you get there, whether you use um, plant medicines to help you get there, but identify what is the root of this and why am I stuck? Was there a disempowerment? What was that and what was the role? Who was I playing that out with? And there's so many different ways that you can go into that. Um, you know, we talked about constellations therapy, but also just speaking with, you know, in the context of the group that you already have formed and the support that you have to be able to play these roles out. Who couldn't you say no to? What was that about? Was that a boyfriend? Was that your father? Was that, you know, your masculine older sister? I mean, it could be anyone because we all have this balance of masculine and feminine in us. And oftentimes it's rooted to one specific disempowerment. And I know that I've been able to stand in my truth and be able to stop patterns and cycles of behavior. And my, my work was through soul retrieval and getting that essence back and finding that, um, well, I had one specific soul retrieval after, um, after I had been separated from my ex. And I told this girl who I trained with, you need to get my soul parts back from my marriage. You absolutely need to. And I like grabbed her by the throat. I was like, get my soul parts. And she did. <laughs> it really worked. And it was, you know, it was this ability to say no and to stand in my power, to stand my ground. And then I got a power animal after that that just came in my meditations, which was this, um, this black jaguar who is this ultimate feminine energy, and I stared this black jaguar in the face, in this meditation, I said, black jaguar, why have you come to me? And she just looked at me and she said, because nobody fucks with a black jaguar. <laughs> so whether you're using power animals, whether you're using role play with people who you trust, whether you wanna do that with another man in your life or with other women in your life, but identifying the source and the root is really important to be able to say, where did this go wrong and why am I continually calling this pattern into my life where I'm attracting these people that are forcing me to play out this role, to either step up or fall through the cracks and allow their will to sort of bulldoze over me. And then I find that when you start to break those patterns, it's like you're saying to the universe, I, I finally, I finally used this test, I finally got through it and the test is over because you've been able to shift that energy and not fall into that same role. And oh, there's one more thing I was gonna say about that. I think that it's, yeah, that's what I'm gonna say. Thank you. I know I'm the guy on the panel, whoops. 
I, but I'm a guy on the panel, but I want to say something because you're having this relationship with men, you know, how to deal. And a lot of yogis are saying, and I kind of believe it a little, because it doesn't seem so theoretical for me anymore, that we've been in a third chakra masculine existence almost throughout civilization. It's this real ambitious thrust forward, movement, achievement. We went from planting seeds in the ground to atomic bombs in 10,000 years, you know, it's very rapid. And those fires, a lot of folks are believing, are pushing us into this heart center that's opening up. On a, and I feel like it's opening on a planetary level, or at least in nodes and pockets of light. So I, one thing I think it's important we all meet together so we can keep reminding ourselves, oh, this is the new world we want to see. Or as Charles Eisenstein, the author, says, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Um, recently, I've had some major heart expansions. I'm sure I have some major ones to come. But there's this blessing that comes into your life, open your heart, at least it has for me as a, a male, almost approaching middle age, which is you just start to appreciate life everywhere on such a degree. And you want to protect it and nourish it and take care of it. And I understand I, I go home first, meaning in my body, and then I reach out. And I think the art of chivalry is remembered when the heart opens. The magic opens and this idea of a sacred mission in life and a soul mission starts to envelop. And I think as we open our hearts, you're going to find more men on this vibrational level. And there's tricks to noticing it. As you open your heart, you'll notice there's people, their eyes are just more open. They're more aware. They'll be active listeners, like you were saying. And you can start spotting these people. And really, I'm saying this a lot for the men out there, too. But I think women, the art of chivalry is there for you guys, too. We need protection, too, and love and care. And it kind of sucks to be a guy in this culture, too, because you're the perpetrator, you're the bad guy. So many men's group I've been in, we're just like, it sucks to be a guy, we have all this shame. I've been on the opposite end, I've been afraid to, you, you remember that, damn it, Jonathan, why don't you kiss me in high school? I was so afraid of being the perpetrator that I actually think I missed out on some lovely experiences that other people will. I think with the art of chivalry, it kind of takes out the complexity for me. My heart's open, this is loving, I'm always checking in with my feelings, I'm always being a protector and nurturer and caretaker of life. I just, you know, I want to give you some hope that I'm meeting these men out there and women that are enacting this new kind of chivalry. It's almost like a high vibe sci-fi chivalry I see. Um, and it, it, we still need to hold our protection, but also learn when, start to recognize when you're around those beings and they can be like, oh, it's safe, I can fly. You know, it's not like walking through the tenderloin. This is something different, it's a different experience. Okay. We call them divine dudes. Divine dudes. As opposed to, have you heard the term snap? I just told this one. Sensitive, I might blow it. Sensitive new age playa. <laughs> Divine dudes. Watch out. Those good. Snap, man. Maybe not so boy, no. I just have one more thing to add to that. Setting intention and saying, this is the list. This is what I want. Because when we're not clear on what we want energetically, we can be attracting anything. And when you get clear and say, this is, this is what I'm looking for, it will begin to appear. It's that law of attraction, attracting it to yourself, but being clear first. I think he's had his hand up. Yeah. We've kind of neglected this side yeah. of the room a little bit, haven't we? Um, thank you so much for sharing. Um, so the question I had was, uh, I was thinking about uh, loving the unlovable. And so would you speak a little bit about the different scales of doing that? Loving the unlovable within another individual, loving the unlovable within your community, and even globally, like amongst nations. So like how can this concept and the other, and, and the power and energy you guys are talking about, how can it help change the world? to a little bit of what you were just talking about right now, that when we first know the heart of nature. And kind of in the same line is, where do you guys see your work going now in stepping forward into the future? Thank you. A lot of good questions. Yeah. Two-parter. Yeah. So one way I think of that is I actually can 
kind of in my, my head and my heart, draw a line between polyamory and prison abolition. And the reason why I believe that is I, I, I firmly believe in prison abolition. And when I take that stance, I have to look at crimes that have been perpetuated against my community and people that are very strong and very deep wounds. Um, very recently, I had a friend who was um, stabbed to death. Um, it was a very violent death. It was very traumatic. It was completely, it was on a noon on a Monday, and it was very deep. Um, and I do not, I firmly do not believe that my friend's murderer needed to go to prison. Um, despite the fact that that's something that happened. Um, I realized that there was an entire societal overhaul um, that, that it was a community failure that it happens. I think when these crimes happen, they are community failures. And it did require finding a lot of love for the humanity inside that person and doing what I truly believe would prevent crimes like that from occurring again, which were much, much bigger than going back into this, this institution that I do not believe is about justice or healing or transforming people and bettering our communities or our societies. So starting to look at what I believe in terms of transformational justice uh, means looking away from punitive interactions and looking away from, from anger and looking towards solutions and looking towards communication and reconciliation. Um, and I started to realize I had so much more love than I could imagine. That I, you know, I think prior, be prior to examining that, I really thought like I had just kind of a short little reserve of love. And I could run out very quickly if I loved too many people. So I should be very careful and have like a best friend and have a soulmate partner and I have my family and that's where I put all my love. And then realizing that love can make more love. Um, that it's like a machine, and I think a lot of us have a lot of anger and stress machines, and those are the big ones, and we have to kind of learn how to crank the wheel the other way and get it to keep making love. Um, so learning how to love the unlovable, um, it's hard, and I fail at it a lot. Um, I work to try to bridge the gap between where I am and where I want to be there. Um, so I know that it's something that happens every day, and a lot of times it feels like swinging on vines, in that when you're kind of moving from one vine to the other, you get right here and you might not grab that next vine and you're going to fall backwards. And that's not failing, that's inertia. That's you getting ready for that next swing for you to catch it. And I think not falling into shame when we feel our vines going back into retrograde, that is not failure. That is physics, that is inertia, and that's what our thrust to going forward to where we want to be is going to come from. So I think a lot of it is um, really looking forward and finding where your shame cycles are and doing what you can to try to like throw them off whack um, and, and try to find yourself there. Um, and I think I'm going to let other people talk about that and then maybe we can talk about what we all want to do in the future because I think, I don't want to speak for everyone, but probably change the world is probably <laughs> big on this panel. I think that we have to start, if we're going to go globally, we have to start with ourselves. And it's really important to go into our deep, dark places and say, what is it that I am not able to love or tolerate about myself? Literally, go into it. Just close your eyes and feel what that's like and where that is and where there's tightness or where there's a stuckness or where there's a wound. Because we can't tolerate and truly love others until we can love ourselves. And it's about that mirroring. So if I can't love myself, then how can I hold space for you? Because I'm putting my judgments onto you. I'm putting all the stuff that I'm stuck with. So if, if someone's telling you a story and you get caught up in the details, you're like, oh, you know, this disgust or something that comes over you, I always catch myself and say, what is that? What is it that that person is showing me in myself that I'm not able to look at? Because once you're able to go in there and start to have a dialogue with yourself, or say, you know, I don't feel beautiful, or I don't feel pretty enough, what is that? Going into, is that a five-year-old who just, you know, was picked last on the dodgeball team? Five-year-old is kind of young for dodgeball, so that's a bad example. But, you know, feeling like there's a wound in your childhood, a wound in your past, or a wound in, or flaw in yourself, and beginning to see what's good about that. I think starting, you know, just to start, if it's self-love that's an issue or it's a hurdle for you, start working with what you're grateful for and working with gratitude and starting to open up that space because it really starts to release your heart and you're able to accept yourself on a deeper level. But I think before we can go anywhere else, it's about healing those old wounds and healing ourselves so that we can hold space for other people to begin to heal themselves and thus start working on more of a global scheme. 
there, there's this tribe that I heard about when someone commits an act, a crime against the tribe, they put that person in the center, they get all the tribe people around them, and each person says one honorable thing that that person did. And they go through the whole tribe. And I think our, I don't think it's just the prison system, I think we're in a punishment system. Yeah. Our education system, I think even our health system is a punishment system. Who likes to go to the hospital? People love coming to my healings. I hate going to the hospital. And um, so it's, I think it's getting from a punishment to a, an encouragement model, which is where a lot of my practice is going now. That's why I like the kind of, I sometimes call it soul surfing. It's like when you surf waves, you encouragement, skills, awareness, and betterment, all those things, you build, you build confidence and start surfing larger waves. I honestly think maybe if we just practice modalities that build confidence in people and show them that they were capable of things, uh, we'd live in a different world. Uh, we're still in a world where we try to take each other's energies, project instead of filling here, encouraging each other. I, I really like teamwork for that too. It's like, and that's why I'm not always such a fan of like deep therapy process stuff, because I'm sometimes like, well, let's create. Let's. Where are you going? What's your next vision? Often, I think sometimes we're so depressed. People are depressed and whatever. It's because they actually have very high running energy that's totally slowed down and stuck. So when we start living legendary lives and we start dressing in ways that excite us and doing things that make us feel powerful and just loving that, we start hitting our A game. I always kind of do these scales with my clients of like, well, in your life, where do you feel? And they're like, I'm at a, I'm at a D. It sucks. Da, da, da. I'm like, that's, you're at a D. That's great. And they're like, what? I'm like, well, what happens when we get to a C? And then we get you up to a B. And then finally, we get up to an A. The, the amount of progress is just going to be incredible. And then they're like, oh, wait. I'm not seeing this in the same way anymore. And then it becomes kind of an act of mastery. I really do think life is kind of this beautiful performance art piece, if you will, and we're meant to have a lot of fun with it. Do you want to do the part two? Yeah. Start. Oh, future goals, future goals. Um, I'm finding that I had a, basically I had the worst 2013 ever. It just, it was the, it was the truck that ran over my life. And uh, I find myself really trying to build myself back up and getting back to his place of confidence because I, I, I really did pretty much have everything ripped out of my hands. It's not a fun process, but there's a lot of growth that comes from it. So a lot of what I've been doing has just been getting back, um, getting back to my confidence and getting to feel that my creative output is good. I really love being able to perform. I love being able to get on stage. I love all the many opportunities I've had. I, I like coming up with fun projects. So I'm hoping to find more fun films that I get to make. I've, I've got to make a lot of really good ones uh, that I'm proud of, and it's really great to see them get some awards. The XBiz Adult Entertainment Awards has never had a category for feminism. This has just never been thought of. That's basically just been like the stupid category or like what happens when the same producers of mainstream porn try to interpret what they think women like. I have really enjoyed getting in there and saying there's a different form of filmmaking and we are doing it and it is happening and here's some of the projects that we've worked on. So um, I would like to do some really just crazy fun projects. Uh, I would like to continue to infiltrate uh, bigger projects with pit hair because you don't ever see it and that's maybe not like a big community room thing. Maybe we don't all share this goal but it's one of my goals. <laughs> I'm bringing I'm bringing pit hair back. So that's, that's basically, I kind of, by the end of 2014, I want people to see a lot more like bush coming out of the skinny jeans, like, yeah. and then seeing like maybe some pit hair, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so basically that's what I'm trying to do, so I'm trying to bring it back. So yeah, watch for it. It'll be on every runway. <laughs> So the way that my practice is evolving, um, it started with my story um, and I felt called from spirit to bring my story to the world, which is playing karma, a former church girl's true journey from bondage to enlightenment, talking about all these different ways that we try to get our power back by playing these roles or by filling those voids, those energetic voids 
um, with food or with power, with money, with sex, with relationship, with addiction to distraction, the internet, the list could go on and on. And speaking about my personal experience of working in the dungeon, perpetuating these wounds in myself, um, and realizing that I've tried to fill all these energetic voids with everything except for myself. And coming back to that essence that was lost and regaining it from those instances. And so I see my work being the spokesperson for soul retrieval and being a pioneer in bringing soul retrieval as the next logical practice in psychotherapy. Because we talk about disassociation, about being disconnected from these aspects of ourselves, but we never talk about how do we empower ourselves or how do we get that part back. So bridging the worlds between psychotherapy and traditional shamanic practices, soul retrieval being one of many, um, but one that's deeply resonated with me and my path. Um, and also working with the shadow by making BDSM something that's more acceptable and seen to play with those dark energy, those archetypes that we oftentimes are afraid to really bring into the light. Because the shadow is where we have so much power. And it's like the brighter our light, the darker our shadow. So we need to go in and see where we're afraid or what we're holding back because that's what needs to be healed. And when we heal that, there's so much power in it and it's so juicy. And it's like if you just go into that darkness of yourself and aren't afraid and don't judge it and just accept it and love it and ask it what it has to teach with you, you become a powerful motherfucker. <laughs> Well, we have heard motherfucker on the panel tonight now. <laughs> um, where I'm going, uh, has anyone here read, I love, here we go again. Has anyone here read my book, The Electric Jesus? Anybody out there? Sarah. It's a great book, isn't it? Oh, God, if you guys haven't read it, it's so good. <laughs> it just tracks all this counterculture stuff of like the last seven years in a fun, easy read, so pick it up. <laughs> if, if this was in New York, we would have got a lot more. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start my next book. I think I'm going to call it Psychonaut, and I'm very excited. Uh, my friend Carl. Carl, do you want to raise your hand? Or no? <laughs> oh, there he goes. We are we're actually talking to Sarah about maybe doing a Psychonaut salon here with Erie, so we'll check in on that and like really have psychonautic explorers, like people that are exploring the dimensional realms of consciousness, whether it's through psychedelics, modalities. I'm also very interested in how technologies can accelerate what we do. It's, it's humans seem to be very good at that. I'm very interested to see how frequency and light therapy and sound therapy and all of these things fit in together. Uh, I'll probably be doing either some psychonauting or soul surfing uh, cannabis classes, maybe starting in my home office. So if you guys signed up for that newsletter I sent around and you want to join on for a good ride, we'll, we'll do some of that. Also, you know, I just moved to San Francisco from New York, so it's very exciting to be here. Um, I have my practice here in the city in the hate, so if you'd like to set up a session, we'll give you a nice little discount. Uh, and the sessions can be whatever you want. You could be trained in energy medicine. I'm going to do some energy medicine courses here. You can um, do like process work and life coaching. Or if you want to go on the wild side, uh, if you have your medical marijuana card, you could set up a special session and we'll do my Tony Hawk energy healing stuff, get you on the table and get some really high vibe uh, energy flowing through. I really feel like my mediumship is opening exponentially right now and I'm understanding about guides archetypal energies, how to use really high vibe energy for healing. So that's where a lot of my stuff's going. But weirdly, it sounds all very esoteric, but I always like to try to do things in practical ways with media, creating com community events, and those kind of things. Probably from my old activist days. Can I ask a quick question on that subject? Um, just on the subject of psychonautica and, and mediumship and all of this fun stuff. Um, I just wanted to ask about the um, like erotic quality of the entheogenic experience itself. I know I've heard you speak about entities. I want to hear some of that. Um, in all like traditional, um, in many traditional cultures, like that's such a huge, huge factor. It's this very private, almost like sexual act. Um, there's this, you know, this idea of the plants uh, are are jealous of each other, of of other people, um, and. Um, Speaking of psychonauts, Terence McKenna had this idea that um, 
that our culture, like by passing through the like psychedelic space faring phase, we're opening to this idea of encountering the other. And all of these societies are very familiar with that. They're speaking the language of, of wind, of water, of bird, and et cetera. Kristen, the um, walrus comes up um, strongly. And, um, and, uh, and we're becoming aware of this possibility for some kind of like sexual completion with a non-human species. And it certainly comes up in journey work. Um, are we going through some kind of cultural puberty? How do sexuality and psychedelia combine to <laughs> inform this? Uh, yep, yeah. okay. Any ideas? I, I have a story that popped up, and I'm sure these guys too. <laughs> Sarah, I love the question. I mean, I am a little jealous, because I have a friend, and I almost believe him, that says he He's been sucked off by an astral, a very beautiful astral mermaid. And that just seems like a quite lovely experience. And he said it was energetically the most healing thing he's ever experienced in his life. He's a really sweet guy. It was kind of weird to hear him talk about this. Um, all right, so here's a public story I've never shared. Uh, where's this camera, where's this video going? <laughs> he's going to go on to the Erie website. Okay, what the fuck. Yeah. So, anyway. <laughs> I, I went to a kink.com event that was about BDSM. I went home, smoked some cannabis, and we were in my energy medicine school that weekend. The whole class was learning the second chakra. And I was having a lot of traumatic stuff about sexual abuse come up right before that second chakra class, which is always kind of the way it is. You know, you're about to process something. <laughs> and I came home from the kink thing, and I, my guides just came in, and they showed, they were like dancing and showing me BDSM, oh yeah, fuck yeah. And it had this beautiful like pink colors and stuff, and suddenly I was thinking, well, maybe these BDSM people are a little bit like these big wave surfers. They figured out ways to go into incredible uh, terrain energetically and open stuff up. And so I told myself, okay, I'm going to promote myself to watch stuff I usually wouldn't watch on a site that I might not normally go to. But it's going to be one that's femme-driven and, you know, loving and all of that. Like, you can tell the ones that enjoy it, I think, and are really loving what they do. I, I, I'd love to get your perspective on this, actually. Yeah, and the ones, the ones that seem like they're, they're not enjoying it or it's a day job or something like that. So I put on a little BDSM porn that was beyond my normal edge and really loving it energetically, feeling so many openings, so many experiences, and then I just see this giant light come in. And I hear, Diana! And this voice comes in and just opens up my second chakra. It's a spirit. I, I realize it's a spirit. You know, I don't know what else to call this, or energy consciousness. Heart chakra, second chakra, immediately open. My hips start moving, my, my heart starts moving, and then suddenly, I realize she wants to dance, and so she literally jumps up, and this female spirit is dancing through me like a vortex, and there's just this vortex of energy coming through me. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, this is one of the coolest fucking experiences I've had. There is a spirit inside of me cleaning me out in the feminine energetic centers, and this was very sexual, very sensual. But what I got was, it's an archetypal connection I have. You know, in mediumship, you'll probably learn if you got, you guys, you probably have different paths in your study, but I find it to be fractal upon fractal upon fractal kind of thing. It's hard to discern what's what exactly. And often you have resonant frequencies with that. And this Diana, Artemis, Athena archetype just started showing me all my feminine aspects, opening them up, opening blocks. I started peacocking up. I started feeling so bad for men that have to dress like they have. They, don't, they can't wear elaborate outfits and do these amazing things and express themselves because that's wussy. I started doing all of this. I got so much guidance on just letting my feminine peacock out and shine. And ever since I did that, life is a lot more fun. And I, I personally, the one way thing I do, I, mean, I maybe didn't do it so much tonight, but I like to kind of dress up like my inner rock star so that she, the diva, really gets to rock it sometimes. And when she comes in, when it's happening, I'm always in a great space. And one last thought, she's the one that taught me to hit an advanced level. Intermediates force things. That's what I've noticed. Beginners are kind of clueless in figuring it out. They go workshop, workshop. 
Intermediates, they go, they try, they do the yoga, they do the... And then the advance is kind of like, I kind of got this thing. And that's what this guy told me. She taught me grace and flow and the feminine relaxing and dancing so I could get into these yoga poses and just like bring it out to a whole other level. So that's one of my experiences with beings, sexual realms and that kind of thing. Um, when I think of plants and I you know, resonate on that, that question, I think about what I can pull from. I, I kept a salvia divinorum plant, and it was my, a beauty of my collection. I really like it, and because, you know, she, she likes some of the tropical climates, and I watched her, you know, trying to figure out what would help her thrive, I realized that she'd like to come into the bath with me. So, you know, I would pour a hot bath and let that steam come in and prop her up, um, and do my bath thing, which usually is, it's a very elaborate thing. It involves, you know, like tea that's made perfectly, and then I always have to have my pipe out, and I have to have the right book, and the right music, and the right lights, and the right candles, and the right incense. So it's already a ritual that I have, and I brought my plant teacher in with me. And it was interesting to have those little intimate moments, to sit and either, you know, enjoy whatever intimacy I have that she's bearing witness to, or contributing to just by sucking up some of the same steam. Uh, and actually getting to know it and stare at it in an intimate way. You know, when you're in the bath, you're already looking at yourself, you're getting into your body and you're relaxing, and I would just stare at the plant and stare at the leaves, and not necessarily use it, but just look at it, and just know that I took care of it, that I took care of her, I gave her the right kind of water, the right environment, and just building that intimacy with a plant. And then when I would go to, to use her, I would, you know, collect the leaves and, you know, wait till the right time to get it, and after watching her for so long, I would get to know when that would be, and keeping it in little vials, um, I do think it changed what it was like to use it, just because I knew this plant very personally, very intimately, and I tended to her for a very long time before I ever actually um, used the plant medicine. And so I do think there is an interesting energetic sharing that goes on, that if you're able to cultivate your teacher and have a relationship with it for a very long time, um, I felt very much like a servant to my plant teacher, that, you know, for taking care of her, for having like sometimes these like fun recreational moments, you know, sharing dirty stories, sometimes sharing sad stories, and then going to her and asking questions. She knew what kind of answers to give me because she knew me too. So I, I do, that's what I think of, and I think of my, my little Salvia Divinorum. I have to say that I am so grateful for ayahuasca, for awakening my kundalini in ceremony because I don't need to do ayahuasca anymore to have these visions. And now I'm able to take this plant consciousness who volunteers to work with me on um, this free basis of just channeling in with those spirits. Um, and so I work with a lot of different spirits and I have to say that most of my beautiful sexual unions with some of these spirits have just been through journeying or meditation where I felt them come into me um, and open me up. There was one point where I had um, worked with some crystal skulls in their consciousnesses and um, I was meditating doing this um, chakra clearing that they had given me to do with my clients and to work on myself and it was this point where there's a masculine um, skull, Kanu, and a feminine Juanita and Kanu wanted to work with me and he was like, you need to go get your vibrator, you need to pleasure yourself. And I'm like, well I thought I was doing the chakra clearing, like what is this? And he's like, no, 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 you have to open yourself up. And I need to assist you in this healing. And so I was like, all right, this is a little weird, but it's just me, and okay, like oh, I can get into this, this can be hot. And it was through this that I awoken the kundalini who started to move through me and started to open up my chakras. And then I had this consciousness of this crystal skull, including the wood horse for this year, that came in and I had this really crazy sexual union in this meditation with these two spirits. And they were opening me up to the possibilities for this year. I'm a wood ox and I was told that um, wood oxes or oxes in general don't have great years during the year of the horse. And so I had this fear in me. And so this horse was coming and literally having this union with me to tell me, it's okay, this is a good year for you. And I was impregnated by these spirits with ideas for this year. 
of new projects um, and new healing modalities to bring to my clients and to bring to fruition. And so I have to say that you know you can move with that and ask the plant medicines to teach you those things. And what's so great is you can always access those. question about your next steps and this sort of transformative time that we're in. And I hear people, all of the, we haven't talked about patho uh, pathologies. We haven't talked about closing up or um, health insurance or, I mean, I think at the essence of it, this is health and wellness transforming itself. And I feel like in the Bay Area, you can't throw a rock and not a doula, pro-dom, a sex worker, uh, you know, which is amazing because it's the strong energy towards all of this. Um, but since it's, we're going away from the Western medical model, I, I'm curious to see in your practice and in your process, um, what type of community you have in regard to keeping like circles of accountability and being able to, without regulation, and I think a lot of us don't necessarily want regulation, um, but within the practices and the sort of humble plant medicine or sex work or um, processes that we each go through, how do, how do you envision that in a community space? I know in Iyengar Yoga, I was talking to somebody, they have check-ins once a month and things like that, but um, working with uh, pro dons. I, I know a number of them who, who really want to get out stories, but we have this um, liability in our head, or um, or doulas who want to work with herbalism, but then freak out when they suggest something to a mama in their first trimester, or whatever it is. And so, and and not just sort of promoting communication, but if you have found certain things that fit within the realm and within the culture of ethiogens and sex in regards to those sorts of I have to say that surrounding yourself with people who support your vision, um, creating a safe circle of people who believe in you and have the same goal in mind. Um, I think that accountability of our peers is so important. Um, and I belong to a number of different women's groups where we're able to share what we're doing and support one another and support how we're growing and connect each other with other resources of other people who are doing similar work because the work comes and the power comes in numbers and as we're able to get on the same page it's about sharing where you're at what your struggles are and be transparent about this is where I'm struggling this is the support I need and seeking people who are able to um, have another piece of the puzzle because we all have these unique gifts, but until we come together We're not going to be able to support ourselves in this one vehicle We need to be able to connect with other people who can support us in ways that we're weak where we can support them where we're stronger um, So I don't know if that answers your question fully and I'm not sure that it applies to all of the realms for the work that I've been doing but I say that absolutely support and for me, personally, prayer, um, asking spirit to guide me, because I never know what the hell I'm doing. But spirit will put things in my way or say, go this way instead of that way, and just going and saying, you know, this is what I would like to manifest, and just giving that up to a higher source. Um, and also working with the plant medicines to help me when I don't feel fully connected, to connect in that way if I'm feeling stuck. Accountability is so hard when you're working on the fringes. Uh, regulation is something that I think benefits systems more than it benefits the people who need them. And yet, it is difficult. It is hard. Uh, I'm thinking right now in sex worker circles, of which I absolutely rely on, uh, finding community has been so important. You need to have, you can't, you can't do healing work in isolation. 
Um, it is so important to have reality checks from friends, to have people who can lift you up and down and know what you do and can help remind you that you might need to take a break. Um, you need that. It's so important. And, and yet there's such a fine line between community and cult of personality and who and rises to the top of these social circles and then what happens when they start to take off. And that's where accountability comes in. And it's such, a, it's such a dance. And right now it is something that I'm struggling with in a lot of my sex worker communities. Um, there's some certain kinds of division around issues, especially as we talk about privilege and who can speak and who is leading this movement. Um, the sex worker rights movement is predominantly white, whereas um, sex workers are not necessarily predominantly white. Sex workers are very, very diverse. And what does it mean even that I'm you know, up here speaking? Um, right now um, and in the way that I do. These are questions I ask for myself to hold myself accountable and when I'm involved in media participation, what am I doing it for? Going back to my intention. Uh, and sometimes it means facing hard truths about times when I'm stepping up to serve my ego and not to serve my community or my intention. And I know that I need to step back and make sure that someone else gets up the mic and know that it's my job to support them and the story that they need to share. Uh, and always working on that because I, I, I like to get up here and talk, I do. Um, there's a lot that I face, you know. Uh, it's, it's, it, there's a lot that's difficult about being a sex worker because you are so far on the fringes that you're working on your healing practice and you're also looking over your shoulder because it could be a cop who shows up. Um, looking over your shoulder and the person who comes to seek healing might be coming to hurt you that day. Um, and it's very hard to remain completely open when I have a very big list of concerns um, that have to be addressed before I can do anything positive for anyone at all. Um, and so the only thing that I can say is that it's very complex and I resonate on that question constantly and I don't really necessarily know where it is. I'm looking for ways to solve difficulties with some people in my circle that I do think need to be held accountable and I don't know how to do this in a way that isn't exile or complete rejection um, because um, my community is marginalized and I'm not willing to just send people out to the fringes without any support and yet when I see that they're responsible for damages in my community I know that that needs to be met with justice and that's a question that I'm seeking that I'm working on and when people have ideas about that I, I love to hear them and my door is always open for those because I'm trying to work in an outcome based way and and the outcome should be justice so sorry I don't have a good answer other than wow isn't that a big question I would like to invite everyone, I, I'm not going to speak on this one really, I'd like everyone to turn to the person next to them that they don't know and just share your name and one quick reason why you're here. So that was my point. Did you see the energy? That's the story I learned. So there's a lot of energy, a lot of amazing stories and people here. And that was just my point is that we have community right here. Let's keep creating awesome events, keep getting to know each other. You guys create awesome things for us to get together. I will hopefully get on my newsletter because I'd love to see you guys at some of this cool shit. Um, and that said, I'm going to pass it over to Sarah. Oh, community. I don't know how much time we have in this room, but mingle a little bit, connect. I'm so happy to see all of these worlds coming together, the medicine community, the sexual community, a lot of like dear friends from women's circles, both on the East and West Coast. Happy to hear these things are happening. So um, tough, uh, thank you, rounds, applause, snaps. Yeah. 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 wrap up on the, the Erie Front, just a reminder that March 2nd, women, Women's at the Eugenics Symposium, March 3rd, Kashinoa um, event, Brazilian healers will be here. Those are both happening here. Um, I wanted to send, I forgot to just send one thanks to um, our dear co-Erie um, founder, Larry, who couldn't be here today. He's, um, he's with his dad, and I just want to send like him and his family blessings. He's here in spirit and he's such an integral part of putting this together. And thanks to all of the volunteers um, who helped out. And, um, and everyone who's, ar who's arrived, feel free to sign up for the mailing list. And um, do you all have anything else to say? <laughs> I am totally very active on Twitter. If you see me on Facebook, it's not me. Because I'm not on the book of faces and that is a fraud. 
But if, um, if you're on Twitter, please say hello. I'm um, at Ms. Maggie Mayhem, and I'm very active there. I also blog, so check out www.missmaggiemayhem.com. Uh, and I hope I see you at all kinds of events here in the Bay Area and beyond. A big thank you for showing up and being fully present here. So many of you were really, really present, and that's just so beautiful. Um, and I just wanted to make a mention. Um, there's some flyers, but uh, my friend Catherine and I are going to be running some workshops. I'm visiting from New York, so I'm not usually here, but we're doing um, two workshops this weekend. A journey to embody your power animal, which is incorporating movement, art, therapies, and shamanism, going on a journey in altered state of consciousness to connect to the power animal. And on Sunday, we're going to be doing an ancestral healing workshop, which is going to be really deep, really wonderful, clearing out any um, unserving family legacies out of our body, out of our psyche, ritually giving that up to transmute our energy. So thanks again, guys, and there's more information if you're interested. Thank you. I hope everyone's inspired to go home and, oh, experiment. Here. Oh, okay. oh, you're that was good. Well. Oh, that was I, well. I, I mean, I just want one thank you, Maggie, and thank you, Kristen, for Sarah, for putting this on. Uh, hopefully you got in the newsletter. I, wanted, I hope we see each other for some fun energy medicine, psychonaut stuff, uh, soul surfing, all this. I like to learn, create spaces where we all learn together. You guys have mad skills. I want to learn them, too. Let's connect. And as the old Psychonauts used to say, shit be crazy. <laughs>